Should we do yeah. it? Let's get yeah, let's get started. I, I think them. We have quorum, so we're, we're good anyway. Go for it. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I've got, I guess, who's who's got the slides? Is somebody that can't speak? <laughs> Engage the mouth. Right. Who's got the uh, slides and can share them? Should be Taylor. One second. Yeah, it's Taylor here. I thought they were there a moment ago. Yeah, we just had them up. What happened? One second. Is Taylor still on the call? Because I'm also yeah. not being recorded yet. Yeah, one second. She's restarting. That's ah, what's going okay. on. I'm fine. Uh, God, she's host. One second. Let's give her a minute. I guess it would be good to wait for Taylor, partly for the slides, but also for the record button. Yeah, no, she's got admin access. She should be back in any second now. Looks like she's back, so. Hey, Taylor. Hey there, I'm gonna share one second. No worries. Great. And make sure the recording is, is going too, because that's, uh, looked like it killed that. Oh, and there it is. It's recording now. Okay, cool. Share away, let's get to the agenda and we'll get started. Yeah. All right, so uh, while the slides come up, welcome everyone. We've got a few things to come through. Um, there we go. I think we could move straight on to talking about KubeCon and Cloud NativeCon, which Chris, I imagine you have a couple of things to say uh, about that. Yeah, I'll just quickly, uh, CFP closes for uh, KubeCon. North America on July 2nd. So if you're interested, please get your talks in. Uh, we're doing pretty well on sponsorship. So if you're interested in sponsoring, please um, reach out to us. We've had a huge influx in um, interest in co-located events. So we're doing our best to kind of accommodate, but please get your request in uh, sooner, um, sooner than later. Uh, other than that- Chris? Yep, go ahead. July 12th, uh, 10 days from now, not the second. Sorry. Yeah, I'm still jet lagged from China. Um, July 12th. <laughs> the link is there for the CFP. Um, next up is, uh, you know, we've been doing these conference transparency reports for all of our events uh, moving forward after the TOC requested them. So if you go to the next slide, Taylor. Um, it's online available. There's a PDF and website that basically kind of breaks down, um, you know, number of attendants, number of companies, attendees, percentage of end users versus vendors, et cetera, et cetera. So it's fairly detailed. So uh, feel free to comb through it. But a lot of data is available for you to, to kind of poke out there. Um, we'll be getting the one done for China, uh, hopefully by the, by the end of this month um, also. So if you have any questions uh, on KubeCon or the transparency port, uh, let me know. Just give a couple of seconds in case anyone's got any questions right now. All right. Um, I have a quick question uh, for the call for proposals. Yep. Um, 
are we only allowed to submit one? Is that right? Um, or is there a mechanism for submitted more than one? I believe you're capped to two talks per person that you could submit. If I recall, Dan, you may remember the, the rules offhand. That's correct. You can yeah. submit, uh, you can be a, a speaker or panelist for up to two talks. Okay. It doesn't matter who actually submits it, but you're, you'll only be accepted for one. Right. Okay. Um, and you can do this from the same account. Uh, maybe I missed something, but I, it seemed like you wouldn't let me add another one but it was perhaps just me. It, it, it could be a bug if that's the case. You certainly should be able to submit yeah. to from the, the same account and, and you can uh, reach out on Slack or by email if you're having trouble doing that. Yeah. But j just as an FYI, we don't actually care whether you submit it or a, a co-speaker submits it. We're not tracking by who submitted it. It's, it's who the speakers are. Got it. Yeah, I All thought, right. Dan, that it limited to like if the marketing people were submitting, the marketing person could only submit to the regardless of whether if it was the same speaker or not. That was my experience last year. That sounds like a, a bug. So I'll take that up with Nancy and we'll see if we can adjust the settings. Okay, I'll confirm. I'll try and confirm that and let you know. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions on this? All right, SIGs. Okay, let's move on to the SIGs. So we'll be hearing from SIG Security in a very short moment. Um, SIG Storage, uh, I think the last meeting or roughly the last meeting, we had a, a discussion about the um, co-chair and tech leads for SIG Storage. Um, am I yeah, right, so there are two existing co-chairs and we're looking for approval for Erin as the third. Is that how that works? That, that, that's right. We, we have two co-chairs right now um, and we're looking to have Aaron as the third and we already have um, a couple of tech leads. Um, actually, we have three tech leads and we're looking to, to add Brad and Luis as, as tech leads too um, for the sort of various projects that, that we're looking to, to engage on ne next. Okay. Um, any comments or queries or concerns from TOC folks about those people? I'm going to take that as uh, everybody seemingly happy. Um, do, Chris, do we need to formally have a vote or are we just able to say? You could, you could vote. I mean, if there's no objections here, we have quorum. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to have it pass. So. I, I would also accept if anybody said they wanted to um, yeah. You know, push off the decision. That that's also something you can say. Otherwise, I think we should just approve. Just a comment. I think we pushed off the decision about a month ago to give people more time to consider it. So I think we can consider it consider it now, unless there are specific objections. I think that's right. Unless anyone has any new concerns to raise today, I think. All right. Well. They have my support. No, any objections? Nope. All right. I'll consider it approved. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, thank you everyone. Great. All right. SIG app delivery. I know there's been some activity on drafting the, um, uh, what do you call it? Like the uh, starter. Charter, that's the word I'm looking for, thank you. Um, uh, Alexis, I know you're here. Do you think we are, is that in a good state to be discussed, be approved? It's been shared um, <clears throat> with the, everybody who's on the app delivery SIG mailing list, which was everybody who responded to say they were <laughs> interested in being in the, um, in the conversation uh, when we advertised it a few weeks ago. That's about 40 people, I think. Uh, so if you're listening to this call, uh, go look at the SIG mailing list, which you should be on. And if you're not on it, email Amy and me and Michelle. But if you look at it, you'll see references to the draft charter. And uh, we're looking for feedback at the moment so we can start the process of getting um, potential chairs to nominate themselves. We're, we're essentially trying to bootstrap the charter and the chairs at the same time. 
So we did a, an initial cut of the charter to give people a sense of the direction. And now we're sharing it with the community to help finish the charter. And while we're doing that, we're asking the most enthusiastic members of the community to self-nominate as possible chairs. Um, I hope that makes sense. Any questions about that process? All right, so I think the uh, conclusion there is it's not ready for a vote yet. It's still in progress, but, uh, you know, sounds like good progress is being made there. There is at least progress being made. I wouldn't quite go so far as to say good. We had a few <laughs> delays, mostly due to things like KubeCon, um, but it is now in the hands of the right people together. And I think it'll be ready for a vote in probably four to six weeks time, I would hope. Great. I know there was also discussion of a, uh, a networking related SIG that I believe someone was interested in actually forming. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, Liz, this is Lee. Uh, hey. Yes. Yes is the answer. And soon. There's a, um, there's a proposal written that is, I would say, eight, you know, 90 percent draft complete and should be shared on the networking um, working group mailing list. Um, shortly um, in um, feedback and insight from Matt and Ken um, are forthcoming on that as well. So I think it's just still just a, an in-flight in proposal. Okay, great. I think if you, you know, start following the model that, um, you know, SIG security, SIG storage and SIG app delivery have started putting in place that, seems to be working. Yeah, so is there it's a mailing list or anything? Forming like your chart. Yeah. Or is it just an informal group that's pulling to that stuff together right now? Uh, Joe, actually, I think I missed the first part of your question. Oh, um, is there a mailing list or anything sort of formal that folks can get involved with the SIG networking sort of there is. That's still very informal. Oh, I'll, I'll, there is. I'll, well, I'll drop it into the chat, the okay. mailing Okay, and do we have any other folks interested in uh, forming any other SIGs right now? Yeah, I, I volunteered to help uh, set up the applied architecture SIG if, if there's demand. I just uh, a bit backlogged at the moment. I, I was intending to have started it by now, but I have not yet. Uh, I can do it in the next few weeks if there's demand for that. So what, what SIG I missed that one? Uh, it's it's called core and applied architectures. So it's it's basically uh, Kubernetes and and uh, applied architectures of Kubernetes. Um, and and I was just to be clear, I was just offering to kind of kickstart the process of drafting the charter uh, and goals, etc., and and trying to solicit some interest in people to serve on it. Now that's um interesting name for it, but okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll wait to see uh, see the straw man. Yeah, and that, that's certainly the name is up for debate if you like it. It was kind of debated in the uh, original SIG stock, but but it would be up to this new SIG, SIG to clarify the charter and, and if they decide it's necessary to rename it. Okay, great. It, it does look like a very large set of um, Technologies there covering orchestration, scheduling, and runtimes, etc. So uh, there we go. Okay, I think the one that stands out that we don't currently have uh, any in flight is probably observability. So if there are folks out there interested or thinking about setting up a SIG for observability, that is open. <laughs> For those of you who missed the last 18 months of discussion on Twitter, observability is monitoring, logging, tracing, and debugging. Okay, so um, I think we can probably, unless anyone wants to say anything else about SIGs, let's move on to SIG security. And uh, Justin Kapos, I believe, is gonna be telling us about SIG security assessment process that they've put in place. Great. 
Well, thanks, Liz. Um, yeah, so what we've done is we've set up um, a process by which we take a project. At a, for the moment, we've really looked at a few security projects and uh, gone and provided a lot of security information and context at a high level. This is not meant to be uh, to take the place of an audit, but is meant to tell you things like, what is the system designed to do? Where are the gotchas that? Um, where are the things that if you configure it, you should think about it? What sort of protection should you expect to get uh, when this is used? Is the project developed in a, in a way that makes sense? Or you know, are you likely to find a lot of problems with it? Things like this. Um, so this is meant to be helpful for anyone who might sort of adopt it and also meant to let the TOC and others go and look at this and try to decide, is this the kind of project that from a security standpoint, we want to have uh, you know, be admitted into the CNCF? And we're not trying to go through and um, you know, actually go through and say, ha, aha, we found a buffer overflow here, or we found this issue there. Um, there would be a later assessment by Cure 53, Trail of Bits, or whomever else uh, the TOC contracts out to find those types of issues. Uh, next slide, please. And really, as I said before, there's, there's two main audiences here. We're really trying to answer these sorts of questions um, you know, uh, from the CNCF end user standpoint to help, help you figure out what, the, you know, what security properties you'll get by using a project and how to set it up correctly and then the TOC to understand things about um, you know, where maybe gaps are at in the TOC's landscape, how do we improve existing projects, and so on. Um, to this point, we've gone through and done um, several uh, assessments. There's a very long and painful assessment that the Intoto project that went through as they, it was the first project to be assessed, so um, we kind of rewrote the rules I don't know, three or four times as it went through the process. Uh, OPA is mostly through the process. We just need to do a little bit of sync up and declare them final. Keycloak and Falco have expressed a lot of interest, and I know uh, Spiffy, uh, Spire, and others are also, I think, ready for a refresher for this. Our plan is to conduct these initial an initial set of about five assessments, and then go through and um, sort of revise and formalize some of the steps that we're doing in a way so that we can make sure that things are much more uniform. Uh, I'd like to thank a lot of the, the people that have gone and participated in this, this uh, you know, Sarah Allen, Justin Cormack, um, uh, Brandon and uh, Brandon Lom, and uh, a bunch of other people that I'm gonna be embarrassed that I've forgotten that have started with it bar. Um, and if you're interested in participating, please come join us and uh, join our meeting on Wednesday at uh, 11 a.m. Eastern time, whatever that is in your time zone. Uh, and uh, we'd love to have you participate. So uh, I'm confused. Are we just doing CNCF projects or non-CNCF projects? But we're doing projects that uh, effectively from our standpoint, it's what's being recommended to us by the TOC. Okay, and so, so what's so, the process for recommending that? Because I don't think uh, we discussed it. Not, I mean, maybe I missed the meeting or the, or the email list, but I, where did that list come from of projects? Uh, we had some initial conversation, and, and Liz and others who know this should really step in, but we had some initial conversation, and we were told these seem like good projects. Like, I, I think when the SIG was formed, there's like, these are these five projects that should be part of it. And that was Tough, Spiffy Spire, um, Falco, Opa, and something else, Istia, or something else. I forget what, but something else that I'm forgetting. And then um, the Spiffy Spire assessment that I did uh, before the, any of this was set up was kind of used as the model. So we said we don't need to do them first. Tough has had a lot of assessment. Thank you. Um, and uh, so then we went and said, oh, OPA would be a good thing. And in Toto, when in Toto was going to come up for vote in the TOC, there was a discussion about why don't you be the first one for this process? So um, we would expect there to be a more formal way to do this in the future. Uh, and um, we also need to have a discussion about uh, should these be things that are refreshed annually? Um, is every project supposed to go through this so that we would look at like Prometheus, which or other projects like that, um, or, or what the process should be. 
Yeah, I just want to make sure that, you know, we we put effort into the things that, you know, are CNCF projects first um, or are well on their way towards a vote. And so I think, you know, definitely, you know, there's been discussions about some of the other projects you mentioned, but but they're not really you know, on their way to a vote right now. So, yeah. so that's the list that's there, Sarah. And I, I heard I heard Key Cloak there specifically. And I know that, you know, we've seen presentations from Key Cloak, but I don't know of any formal submission of Key Cloak to the to the to the CNCF. I know there's been a lot of discussion, but it's been happening one on one. And I want to kind of bring that bring that stuff into the public. Yeah, so um, this is exactly the conversation we want to have. Um, the process is um, that I just put a link to our new issues. We have a, an issue template. So any project or TOC, the TOC can initiate that um, and anybody can put out a request. And then the prioritization is something that we want, like the TOC influences yet we weren't going to wait for the TOC to pick a project if we have bandwidth. So the idea is we queue these things up, the TOC influences the order, um, but then we have a team ready to be doing a security assessment at any one time. And so, um, so yeah, so we, we want to refine that project. At the beginning, we were, you know, we, we had these two queued up in total on request of the TOC, and then OPA, because it was the one in this list that hadn't had an audit or some kind of prior review um, and they were involved in the group. And so, um, so basically we're a little ad hocing it right now so that we have some in the queue and completely welcome whatever process is appropriate for that prioritization. I mean, one of the things that I think, you know, we've been talking about um, across the TOC is getting a, a more sort of structured sort of uh, flow chart in terms of how projects come in different stages and I think it'd be interesting to look at this through that lens and so again so that we move from this sort of ad hoc lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations and then something comes up to a vote there's a bunch of stuff that gets started beforehand to more like okay this is in a sort of you know this stage and so let's activate some of the gears to to make sure we get a closer look across across the various groups there so yeah, definitely something we should take into consideration as we do that. So, all right, thank you. Yeah, and, and also the other thing I wanted to mention is that we thought we would start with the security focus projects because one, they need an assessment and the other thing is the people from the project really know their stuff. Um, and then we wanted in this first five to have one project that is not security focused, but then of course has some security. So we're looking for, you know, kind of, you know, guidance on what that project should be either by a project raising their hand and saying we really want to participate or the TOC identifying one that the TOC is particularly thinks would be a good candidate for like this is a template for a project that has security but isn't for security. Okay so yeah, that, I think it's worth having the conversation in terms of what that sort of non-security focus but security impacting project might be. I have some ideas, but I don't want to start that discussion now. Super, yeah, so I, just for people to start thinking about, because it, it'll be um, probably after we get through a, uh, the next couple. I think one thing that's quite interesting in the discussion of the flow chart here, the flow for projects in general, is that SIG security makes sense to review security related projects and also makes sense to review non-security related projects that may need to be operated in a secure way where i think other six there's a more kind of clear um you know if if we had a, an observability sig and we were asking for the observability sig's opinion on an observability project um we we might also want to get sig security's opinion of the security implications of that observability project and i'd also argue that really for any project, um, you at least want to know that you shouldn't operate it in context X or context Y. And so I, I think there's at least some argument to be made that, that pretty much every project should go through this, if for no other reason to, to say, like, this is wildly insecure if you use it in situations A, B, and C, so don't do that. Yeah, a lot of what we're finding is that the assessment process is a matter of saying, oh, maybe you want to put this high up in your documentation, that things that the project maintainers might 
think are clear and obvious to everyone are actually um, a well-kept secret from a user's perspective because projects aren't aware of how users perceive them versus how they think of themselves. I think it might be useful to just circulate an example assessment so that people on the TOC can see the kind of recommendations that you're making. Well, coming up is the Intoto presentation, which includes its security assessment. So this was very much like right before you're about to hear a uh, sample assessment. So that's the first one. We anticipate that it is like, we've been through N like four to six iterations on it. So, and it is not perfect by any means. So that is the first of five that you will hear. Um, and then um, we welcome feedback on the format, the content, all the things. Right. Justin, uh, do you want to take Sagu's question about overlap with the independent security audits? Yeah, I was, uh, yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, the way to look at it is when you get an actual security audit and you read it, it's typically a very dense document where they've gone and they've said, they've pinpointed particular things that they say are vulnerabilities in a project. A lot of times the, uh, the assessment is more meant to provide high level guidance about how to use something and the way to do it in the way the system is intended to be done. So an assessment will do things like help to guide the auditors about what to look at and talk about scoping and resources, whereas um, the audits that you go through typically try to pinpoint vulnerabilities. And so uh, there's a few examples of that. You can see this if you look at, for instance, a lot of the audits that Tough Project has had by different groups or um, audits that uh, you know, other um, CNCF projects have had. There's a, a focus on there is vulnerability X with severity Y, and then that's probably been fixed three weeks later. But that doesn't tell you, you know, when you deploy it, you should think about doing it way X, way Y. This is the secure way to do it, which is more of the assessment process. So I just want to call out in the chat, somebody saying, uh, you know, overlap between, okay, so that's what you just answered. But then Quentin also had his hand up. I want to make sure that. Yeah, I just had a quick question about, um, so, so there was originally a request from the TOC to produce uh, like a white paper um, and, and I think there was some debate about whether that was a good idea or not, but, but either way, uh, it seems useful before going and doing a bunch of assessments to at least agree on some basic ground rules, you know, uh, terminology, uh, you know, these are the general approaches to, you know, the following categories of cloud native security. There's key rotation. This is what it means. These are, you know, it's typically done in the following ways, et cetera, those kinds of things. Do, do we have such a, a general framework uh, before we go diving into specific assessments of specific projects? So um, just as a, before we, the SIG ever got in place, audits were happening. So a lot of this is there's activities that are happening and, you know, that are needed for project, you know, kind of, for the projects to meet needs of the projects. And so well, the process that we're following is to do the activities that the experts within the group know how to do and have that inform the vocabulary. So um, one of the reasons that this um, Intoto project took so long was getting to alignment on what this assessment is, how is it different from the audit, how are these, you know, volunteers from various companies, you know, what's an appropriate role for them to take given that this isn't their full-time job and how is that different? And, and with the knowledge sharing and education aspect of the SIG, how do, um, you know, how, do, how, do, how does that color this process? And so um, it might be appropriate. Do, do, we, do we have something that the TOC and end users can consume that says, uh, uh, this is the scope of cloud native security and these are the terminologies that we use and uh, and everything else should be read in that context. Do we have such a consumable piece of information yet? So as I was about to say, 
Um, the scope of, check of SIG security, which was just formed two months ago, is specified in the charter. And we're working on a roadmap, which we anticipate will include the um, white paper that was much discussed um, many moons ago. And um, it, this security assessment was just prioritized ahead of the completion of that white paper. And so um, it might be appropriate for us to schedule a presentation of the roadmap um, you know, as that gets um, put together so that the TOC can give feedback on that. Um, but yes, we do want to do that and we're taking a bottoms up approach. And so you can see the security assessments. There's a lot of vocabulary that is being used there, but security also includes policy and compliance and a number of aspects that need um, more uh, discussion in order to get to alignment about what the group is comfortable putting forth. Yeah, and I, will, I would also like to jump in and say that um, in these first five assessments, we are trying to be um, quite clear about defining things that we think are unexpected um, for, for readers. Uh, there's a stupid question phase that the person leading the security audit does where they expressly try to make sure that there's meaningful definitions for any terms that they think a reader might not uh, understand. So, uh, but we haven't formalized this process. This would, I think, make sense for us to talk about once we've been through the five assessments and we have a better idea of the right scope and fits into something like what Sarah was saying through it now. It is in the um, charter that one of the things that SIG Security will do is educational resources, which include things like common vocabulary to talk about and understand cloud native security. So I think it's it's documented as part of the charter, but I don't think it has to be done in, you know, the precise order that is laid out in the charter. And I think the fact that there are people volunteering to do security assessments is really, really valuable. There's a follow-up question about SIG security and uh, audits. So I think that that's still in process. Like we, so Justin Cormack reviewed all of the audits and we're trying to figure out what is our role with that. And, um, you know, but I, I think that, I think it would fall under SIG security to coordinate with the auditors, but that is an, a separate CNCF process. So we'd love to see feedback about, you know, how to engage. I assumed it, that it was a matter of logistics and that it would fall under our, you know, sort of broad. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think because the, auditing, because the auditing process started before SIG security existed and is, is, has it's kind of got its own process going, like many of the audits have happened already. We haven't been, as directly involved, but some questions have come out of it, which we're following up on. Okay, any other questions? Oh, no. Any other questions or comments about the security assessments? I would definitely say it'll be really useful to see uh, the example as we go through in total and we can see the, the kind of value out that comes through that. Okay, and a comment there from Sarah about some common vocabulary for use cases and personas. Quentin, did that cover your Question. I don't expect that the use cases and personas covers the questions. It's just I'm trying to illustrate the bottoms up approach. So I'll drop in a few links. We've developed some resources and then, um, you know, and I'll point to some and then we'll, we'll come back with a timeline on the white paper and the other things mentioned in the charter. Quentin, does that address your concern? Uh, it, it does answer the question, which it sounds like the answer is there is not a complete um, <clears throat> body of information that I was requesting. And I just wanted to point out this, this has been requested over and over from that group, which previously was called a working group and is now called a SIG um, for over a year now. <clears throat> Actually, so, I'd like to correct you. Important. We were not, we proposed to be a working group and the request was not clearly presented to the whole group and the priorities were not clear. Um, 
So I think there was some miscommunication between JJ, who was one of my co-chairs and myself. I don't know if he's on the call. And so um, there were things were prioritized differently because we got many different requests from the TOC and we weren't formally involved with the CNCF until a couple of months ago. So we've been doing work that the community that we felt was the community valued in. You know, I think a white paper is a grand idea and it's uh, just not done yet. So to answer your question, this is JJ Quinton. Uh, I think in terms of uh, the first problem that we had uh, with security was the scope was too large to just to make sure that what's in scope and what's out of scope took a uh, lot of iterations and uh, that's specified in charter. And then the second stage of like, what are the category, categories and then all the projects that are associated with the categories that needed some, <clears throat> some form of definition, which I think we took care of. Uh, white paper is an in progress thing. Uh, there's a lot, lot of different ways in which we can actually slice security. Like if you want to layer security in terms of uh, functionally, it's going to look a lot different. If you're going to layer it structurally, it's going to look a lot different. If you want to uh, layer it based off of associated project, it's going to lo look a lot different. But <laughs> to even basically to address what makes sense and how we can actually uh, make sense of this to the end users, uh, a lot of uh, lot of use cases needed to be understood. And I think we spent a lot of time collecting and gathering use cases. Because coming up with a white paper, uh, that's like Functionally narrow will be easier, but so for something like security, it's it's going to take some time. And once you have something, then I'd want it to be a little bit more meaningful in terms of like how we can iterate on it. Right? So that's a long-winded answer. Short-winded answer. Short answer is like we are uh, working in steps to gather enough information so that the white paper is meaningful. Would it make sense to think about um, carving up? rather than doing a single white paper, doing smaller, more focused white papers? Mm -hmm. I'd be yeah. open for, yeah. Uh, In fact, the policy working group subgroup is working on a much more implementation focused policy white paper, whereas the um, white paper that JJ is referring to and Quentin's referring to is more the security landscape and the terms and all the different parts of security. So it'll be more of an overview, like, one of the things that we struggled with is who's the audience for the white paper and that we didn't get a lot of um, input from the TOC on that. And so we talked amongst the different members and, and people in the community and found that, um, you know, and I had a interview with Quentin and it was really felt that the, it's the deciders who need this white paper of like, how do I reason about security in the cloud? And how do I know what, um, you know, how to make these choices and what things should I be worried about? What are the categories? And so, um, so that's where I think we could still use some um, participation of the TOC in validating our assumptions about who is that audience. And um, one thing we've talked about is could we get a few um, people who are from the end user community um, who are representative of the audience to validate the white paper so that they, you know, we could have reviewers who are outside of our group who could say, yes, this is useful content because we want to produce something that is valuable to the audience. Okay, so um, Joe and I are the kind of liaisons to SIG Security. So I think I would make the request to the other members of the TOC that if you have particular concerns about what SIG Security is focusing on, um, you know, let's discuss that and try and come up with a coherent message to the team there. Or um, show up to the meetings. That also. <laughs> All right, any other questions on SIG security or shall we move on? Thank you very much, Justin and Sarah. Thank you. All right, moving on to the question of archiving Rocket. Um, we brought this up a month or two ago already, so I don't think it's a surprise to anybody. Um, but Chris has now created the formal pull request to do the archiving process. Do you want to say something about that, Chris? Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, you know, we, we discussed this last time, I think about a month ago, and, you know, I think we kind of decided to, to, to not, you know, necessarily rush this and, and kind of, you know, given that it's our first archival project, let's take a little bit slow. So, you know, I've had some private conversations with the Rocket team. Um, I filed a public issue kind of um, notifying them publicly that we intend um, to do this, you know, per our process. Um, they're supposed to have essentially two weeks, you know, to discuss or come up with anything before we formally uh, do the vote. So that's kind of where we are right now. I just kind of wanted to kind of bring this up to see if there's any other further thoughts or discussions. Um, I think we're just kind of being slow and careful here, notifying all the respective parties and community that this is going to uh, potentially happen. So from a process perspective, we'll, we'll formally call a vote in about two weeks um, if, if there are no strong objections from anyone. Okay, and then we're going to help the team move documentation yep. and project, you know, yeah, website. We're gonna, yeah, I'll, I'll figure that out. There's some other complicated things where I think they're also participating in Summer of Code, but they're happy to do that. You know, still they're an open source project. We'll, we'll figure it out and kind of document everything. Okay. Just giving a moment for any other comments on that. Hey, this is Jay Pipes. Uh, just a quick question on this. Is there a plan um, to have like official messaging from CNCF with regards to this archiving? We like on CNCF blog or something, like explain the ramifications of it and that kind of thing? We haven't decided yet. I think I'll, I'll kind of lean on the TOC, but if they wanted to put forth a statement or something, we're happy to syndicate it on the blog. I, I, I personally, I think over communication is not a bad thing in this case, but I'll, I'll think, you know, I don't know what the TOC thinks about this. So our first archiving. So yes. we need to explain what it means to archive a project. Yeah. Um, that's an area where I think the executive staff, Chris, could help actually, because it's not just about the TOC. I mean, this is a long-term decision. C correct like that no that is no problem but i think from like a like a toc perspective like we archive it because this project is maybe inactive or doesn't reflect the value blah 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 there's there's that that i'd rather see come from the toc than necessarily staff if, if that makes sense so the technical commentary what format would you like that in a statement a paragraph yeah, yeah statement blog like google doc Okay. Why, why don't we um, suggest, I, I'm, I'm going to float an idea that maybe staff could like come up with a yep. blog post with a space for us to comment, like. Cool. Consider that done. Not a problem. Right. I might have missed it. Is there, is part of our communication sort of like talking about how projects can get unarchived or adopted elsewhere or what have you? Because I think that that'll help it feel sort of less final in case somebody makes the wrong call. And I know like in the past we've said, oh, well, the TOC or, you know, the LF can decide to do this stuff, but maybe having yeah. something that's clear there will help soften this a little bit for folks. Going into the LF is not the end of the road for the project. It just means that it's no longer part of the cloud native tent for the time being. And I think what we talked about before was the idea that uh, a project could be revived. I mean, there are many people who, um, who use Rocket, who may not have noticed this and might come in. There's also people who've spoken on Twitter. I see Chris here from Kinvoke talking about it in the, in the, on the slide, for example. Right, I, I think, I, think I, you know, I, I know that's what we've talked about. I'm just wondering if that's part of the communication plan. Yeah. Do we have that written down anywhere or that has, has that just been informal conversations? Well, we have the reactivation think, archival process. Yeah. But, uh, okay, so that is part of the, you know, I'm just, yeah, just soften the blow a bit, you know? Yep. Yeah, au revoir, not Go ahead, Alexis. I said au revoir, not adieu. All right, so we'll, we'll share a post with um, the TOC and, and then we'll do our best to kind of fill it in. Great. Any other comments about Rocket or archiving in general? Okay. Right. 
10 minutes for backlog. <laughs> Okay, so Chris, I think this is uh, to try and keep us honest and uh, make sure we're working through the, the backlog, right? Yeah, so I mean, the, basically outside of the schedule for uh, the community presentations, I think the important question to ask is, uh, I think it's, it's, it's hard to say no always, right? And, and trying to find projects that you may want to say no to here and, and do it at some time in the, in the coming weeks would, would be good. Um, you know, we're, we, we seem to have an uptick of interest now of, of projects wanting to come in. I don't know whether it's a seasonal thing, but you know, we, we have uh, quite a lot of projects in the backlog right now. So I don't know if there's any thoughts of, you know, how you want to go uh, about this, but I just wanted to kind of raise awareness and uh, make sure everyone's kind of on the same page of what's on the backlog right now. My understanding is that Longhorn is actually ready to present next week. Is that not the case? Uh, we shuffled them around. They're presenting to the storage SIG First, and then in August, uh, they will present um, to, 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 to the TOC and wider community. But okay. there's other ones that have been floating around for a while, like CNI Genie, um, I believe, and, and others that I think just basically need a kind of an answer of what, what we want to do with them. And I think also just referring to Joe's comment earlier, this is one of the reasons why we need a clearer sort of flow chart on what the process is. This is something that um, uh, as the TOC we've discussed privately and uh, we have some volunteers. I can't remember who those volunteers are. I think it's Brendan and Matt to uh, draw up a flow chart because um, we need to get on top of this, this process and make it very clear, not only what order things happen in, but also um, the etiquette of um, approaching TOC members um, just so that everyone knows we are all um, now communicating with each other if we are approached about a, a sandbox project because uh, I think th there were concerns that it, you know <laughs> a bit like if you're if you're a kid and you don't get the answer you want from dad you go to mum right so uh, <laughs> um, we are, while it's totally fine to talk to TOC members, we are now trying to over communicate with each other about conversations we're having around a uh, project, particularly Sandbox. Okay, so um, I don't know if anyone has any particular strong feelings about any of those backlog. For, I mean, I think Longhorn is going to be presented. Do we know about dates or, or prospective dates for any of the other proposals in that list? No, uh, some of them will shift to August. I'm still trying to track down folks' availability and, and so on, so. Um, Chris, this is Aaron. I joined late, so maybe I missed it, but are, do we have clarification of what we want for Sandbox projects? Are we gonna require a formal proposal and a presentation when the charter doesn't necessarily reflect that? Generally, uh, I think the legwork of doing a uh, formal proposal to PR uh, and starting from there and kind of deferring to the TOC whether, you know, hey, maybe there's two immediate sponsors or they want to see a presentation and so on is, is I think, is a, is, is a better path than just asking for a presentation. It puts a little bit more legwork on the okay. project. So well, we then. should probably update that in yep. as part of the sandbox requirements so it's more succinct and then I'd be happy to put together an example PR yeah. what we expect as part of that if if that would be helpful sure. I just I seem to kind of get a lot of these questions and it's not necessarily intuitive if you're a brand new project coming to want to present I think that would be very helpful Erin thank you and I think actually as part of that that can help us as the TOC figure out you know, whether there are other questions that we should be asking before we accept a project in at Sandbox or any other level, um, having a template for all those questions. Right, because we did that. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I have a lag in my network. Um, it's, and I think we did a really good job at that with the due diligence when Quentin put that together, but I don't think we ever stepped back and did the same thing for Sandbox, so. Yeah, I think I completely agree. Great. Yeah, that, that due diligence is, is a bit vague with respect to the different categories. So it gives general guidelines for how to look at a project and how to evaluate it, but it doesn't 
is not very good at distinguishing between these things have to be there for a graduated project, these things for a sandbox, these things for a incubation, etc. Perhaps it's worth uh, refreshing that document in that context. Well, and I think it changed, Quentin, if you remember right, because we did used to do due diligence even on sandbox, and then we had so many projects it just wasn't scalable. So then we said, well, we're not going to do due diligence. We're just going to do presentations. Um, so, yeah, I think if we split it out into the categories and kind of loose requirements, at least for each, it would give a better set of guidelines for the TOC that's consistent for every project coming in. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, that's all I had. Thanks. All right, I think uh, we can all take this as a bit of a kick to uh, take a look at the backlog issues, see whether there are. And I think um, TSC members, let's all try to over communicate with each other whether there are some projects here that we do or don't. You know, if we have objections to a particular or concerns about any of these backlog projects, let's share those concerns so that we can start saying no, because I think this is one of the problems here. We need to say no to some projects. Oh, Liz, yes. Um, yes. as part of saying no to some, does there need to be a reevaluation then after we're finally done with the backlog to go back and based on some new set of standards, say no or say you have to come up to this next level? I just, I'm, I fear there's a, an inconsistency just based on the number of projects coming in, the changing of the TOC, the changing of the policies, that someone who did it a year ago compared to now isn't judged by the same, you know, set of rules. Measure yeah, I think that's completely fair, completely fair criticism. I think maybe having that kind of set of questions um, and the, the documented flow of how the project should work and perhaps if we are clear, something we, we talked about um, was the, the idea that when we say no to a project, it, in the hypothetical situation where we say no to a project, we should be trying to document why we've said no, but with um, a certain level of discretion that, you know, if we you know, if somebody submits a project and it's just in terrible, terrible shape, and really what we're saying is this, this project is in terrible, terrible shape, we may not want to say that publicly. We might want to communicate that privately. But I think if we're having more um, uh, general guidelines on, for example, this project, you know, we're saying no to it because you're not prepared to move it to a license that the CNC would, would you know that would be a very clear reason why we'd say no and we should probably come up with a few more of those reasons why we why we would say no and why we do say no when we when we do <laughs> yeah also I'm seeing um yeah okay so a couple of comments coming up here. So Lee was pointing out that the requirement to present is listed in the sandbox process. And to my mind, we should have that presentation before TOC sponsors actually commit to sponsorship, because otherwise, how do we hear about objections? Um, yeah, I think so that's I think about right. Yeah, the, the, in my mind, like the redirection of um, Longhorn to the storage SIG is is in part what I think those working groups and those SIGs are, are for. And so, yeah, that as a general, I don't know that we necessarily state that in there, but that can be a way of uh, ensuring some diligence, um, offloading the TOC some, allowing the TOC contributors to enter in and, and assist. Um, so I don't know if those, there, there are two places where that requirement, that presentation requirement is called out. and. Yeah, I don't know if refinement there is necessary or not in terms of funneling through a, a SIG first. One thing yeah, that I think is worth for the updating. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, 
<laughs> so one thing that I think it's worth updating the larger community on is the, the TOC got together and one of the things we talked about is just creating more communication about as projects start engaging with the TOC across the different TOC members. So one of the things that we're doing is that if you talk to any of us about a project uh, becoming a uh, sandbox or incubating project, we just want, we're going to share that information across the TOC as soon as possible, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, because I think that, you know, things can get uh, pretty confusing when there's a lot of one-on-one of -on -one conversations and um, we don't want, you know, somebody in the TOC having a concern and then somebody else committing to a sandbox project without having a chance to really have these things talked through. Thanks, John. Sarah, also your comments about having a clearer um, communication to the six about how to prioritize requests and roadmaps. I think that does also make sense. Yeah, and we're kind of making up the SIG process as we go along, but um, we'd actually anticipated that we would present our roadmap before presenting the security assessments and thing because Intoto has been waiting for like six months to actually do their presentation and proposal to this TOC. We kind of did things out of order and probably should have acknowledged that. I really like the idea you just posted there about labeling in the backlog when a project proposal is related to a SIG. I think that could be a useful part of the process. Cool, cool. yeah, I'm happy to do it. We're uh, running up on time, so. Yeah, we are. Was that the end? Have we got anything else? Nope. Cool, see everyone next week. Awesome, great. See you all next week.